Hello? Hi. Do you want to just say hi? How much do we have? We've been there, to the stream online, maybe a few minutes. But we're ready to go. So it's just just more fun if you want. Do you want to put the slides on? Becky, yeah. you look above me, you're the wrong way around. <laughs> <laughs> Within uh, the Manchester International Congress, um, and then hopefully we are moving seamlessly to some speakers from um, science and public um, conference in Nottingham um, before then flying right over um, the Atlantic to um, to um, history of science bloggers um, who will be joining us um, all by the power of social media, uh, Google Hangouts. I'm just crossing every. Uh, digit that I have, so this will all work feasibly and it will be kept and archived um, on the blog um, thereafter. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Science and Public Conference, um, as their strap line says, um, includes critical perspectives on making science public. Um, so it includes people in history, but also science communication, science policy, um, and obviously will bring some fascinating perspectives um, for us, mainly historians of science, technology, medicine in Manchester, um, on the issues um, of public engagement, as well as all of our sort of still quite nascent use of social media. Um, so our speakers, if I could just have the second slide. Um, yeah, uh, in a moment, you'll see them. Um, and this is the order that we will put in, um, as they go from Manchester to Nottingham to um, the United States of America. Um, and we're going to try, it's a lot of speakers, we're going to try and get a lot of ideas um, in quickly, um, hopefully with people uh, speaking for about five minutes each. Um, and um, then we will manage um, the discussion as much as we can um, between the groups, uh, or possibly keeping it within this room if that makes life a lot easier. We may also lose Nottingham at some point in the proceedings, um, as they have a different timetable and schedule to keep to, um, but we can continue the discussion um, in this room from what we've heard. Um, so the session yes. is not only happening via social media right now, but it's um, brought about by social media too. So I think this says a lot about what you can do um, for us as academics. Um, so reading about the plans for people involved in the two conferences on Twitter, I thought, you know, it's a shame we're in two different places, but it's at the same time. It's like, can we bring this all together in some way? And it's like, yes, we can. And so we try to. Um, it's also for me um, a great opportunity to reflect on um, what's, you know, I, I've, my experiences of using Twitter and blogs, um, particularly um, in the last um, really two or three years. Um, so I, I want to get a review um, on on how it works, what doesn't work, what different types of engagement um, are possible and not possible within our discipline and, and allied um, areas. 
I think um, certainly Twitter and blogs work best when you use them um, as engagement itself is supposed to work, which is conversationally um, rather than simply broadcasting and um, talking to yourself or your sort of near disciplinary fellows. Um, it's something I've learned um, by doing, by using, and also being corrected along the way um, by people um, who know more about engagement than I do. So I talk about popularizing or making things more interesting for a wider public, and then I've had to learn from people like those um, in Nottingham and um, what that really means. Um, and I'm sure I've got better, but I still have much more to learn. On Twitter, and place like that is relatively easy and, and great in a really good way of getting beyond your immediate disciplinary bank um, and realizing who else um, is interested in what it is you do or they have feelings about how it is. Um, I think possibly it was um, relatively easy for me to get into that um, once I decided to take the plunge into Twitter because um, I'm not only um, in it as an academic, but I was um, there and identifying myself as a curator working um, at the National Maritime Museum and the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. So there were people with interest in museums or in um, those particular museums or in open observatories or astronomy who noticed me as well as immediately other historic sites. So I think that got me quite quickly into a range of different duties. Not all of whom perhaps um, would have expected me to come from a um, historical background that I do. Um, so it, it's quite easy to find friends, but then also enemies on particular topics. And there are certain Q plus um, topics that I could mention. I won't go through them all, um, but you know are likely to get strong reactions. Um, but you can also you find a lot of backup, and that's a very nice thing about Twitter. Sometimes it's hostile, but you also get a lot of backup if you do find yourself um, on the flag. And then you also learn from that process about how to engage on those particular topics better. Um, I have learned that historians of science, I mean, just as historians don't own history, we don't own history of science. We may feel that we do, but um, other people in the public sphere feel that they own various parts of it more than we do. Um, or they don't know anything at all about our approach and therefore are very surprised by the way we talk about it. We certainly have a long way to go um, in terms of testing. getting our work out. If we want to. Um, uh, okay, great. Can you hear me? Um, Hello. If we want our version um, of history science to be a one, one of the sort of standard um, stories about these topics that people in general would come across. Um, I'll line on topics like astrology, which is one where I, I came into some uh, interesting um, conflicts with a number of um, people online. Um, seem very uncontentious to us. We've been very used to thinking about it as part and parcel of the history of science. Um, people obviously very much don't see astrology as part of science. So um, people come to history of science from a certain perspective. Um, hear what we're saying. Something like that is like a red rag to certain bulls, and it um, can create, um, as I say, sort of uh, spats and, and disputes and uh, enmities that come from that. Um, sometimes in a very extreme kind of response. Um, so one question I'm just going to end with before passing on to the other speakers um, is, is it better to attack areas like that, issues like um, astrology, complementary medicine, um, kind of uh, control tiles, um, or uh, Darwinism, those topics that really get a huge response from people beyond our sphere. Is it better to go in there, sort of, um, you know, attacking it as we can, weathering the storm, but trying to push our agenda, or perhaps to avoid them and actually find other ways in areas that are sort of calmer, find a space to um, put our um, view of the way science works across into something less contentious. Um, but I shall now pass on to the next speaker, which is Vanessa Heggie, who um, is at the University of Manchester, and take it away. Birmingham. Birmingham, sorry. <laughs> We're in Manchester. We're in Manchester. Birmingham. Birmingham. <laughs> um, yeah, so what I'm going to uh, run through very quickly in five minutes are five major lessons that I've learned from the last year or so of blogging seriously and then um, a long and retrograde career um, and various haunting wiki sites and um, internet forums of students and having arguments with creationists, etc. Um, so those are mostly negative things, but I realize that those are the things that you tend to learn more from than positive stuff. So this is not intended to be how terrible Twitter and blogs are. But the five things are Firstly, to be aware of invisible baggage. Secondly, don't argue on Twitter. Thirdly, prick your bubble but stick your arguments. Fourthly, the Dunning-Kruger effect and self-promotion. And fifthly, blogs are not articles, which is a point I can't have home long enough. <laughs> so invisible baggage relates quite a lot to what Becky was telling you about, but it's the fact that any time you pick up a topic, 
You've got to find that amongst your audience there are people who have been having arguments about that for probably the last 30 years. And there are people who think it's completely new and they've never heard of it at And an awful lot of the um, conflict that I think happens on social media is because of the invisible baggage that people are carrying to these debates. That people will read what you've written about astrology or something else and they will assume, therefore, that you're this sort of person, that you read X, Y, and Z. If you support so and so, you also support somebody else. And those things are not necessarily made explicit. And that's when you find yourself having completely baffling arguments with people uh, about topics that, that they seem incredibly upset by, way beyond the actual seriousness of whatever it is you've written about. So, for example, if you write about science in the public um, sphere, you will be considered by some people to be a science communicator. And they will judge you by the standards of science communication. And sometimes historians come out quite bad because that's not necessarily our major interest. Um, and similarly, there is a small but very vocal subsection of, of nouveau geeks, new sort of pop sci uh, fans, who will assume that if you say anything that is critical or relativist or socially constructivist, you also support creationism, deny um, global warming, love homeopathy, refuse to access for children, and so on. And those are sort of arguments we find just things like, if I do what? And those are very, very interesting, but can be incredibly frustrating. The other side of this is, is it makes it painfully aware to you what sort of baggage you carry. Because you will find that you assume that person X must also believe Y, or that anyone who agrees with you on this topic must also agree with you on that topic. And those are the sort of learning experiences where you realize the assumptions that you've made about how they need to come together are not necessarily universal. Um, relating to that, Twitter is a great place to disagree with people. It's a terrible place to have an argument. It's just the medium is too short. You will have misunderstandings relating to this um, invisible baggage that you're carrying. It's a very, very bad place to have a long and extended detailed discussion. Um, Blog posts, however, are much better places to flesh out the issues that are going on and start a proper conversation with isn't just little snipes and people coming into corners. What I would say is that um, I think it's generally a bad idea to rush straight into a blog post. Not just because you're heated, but also because your audience at that point is probably going to be an echo channel. It'll be the people having the argument at the time who will already either disagree or agree with you. If you leave it two days, you're going to be in a much better position to write something that actually might be interesting to other people who weren't involved in the argument to read. So it's always worth taking a step back from the Twitter argument, but using it as something to inspire you to write more. Thirdly, um, brick your bubble, but pick your battle. So this bubble is this idea that because of tailored search engines and so forth, we end up in this bubble on the internet where we only see the things that kind of relate to us and our interests. We never benefit from the huge diversity of the web. Um, so if your Twitter feed or blog role is noting historians of science, then perhaps you're doing it wrong. I mean, the joy of being out there is that you can actually read from museum curators and neuroscientists and undergraduate students and so on, because we all know historians of science and we spend our working lives in historians of science and we read stuff by historians of science and we go to conferences in historians of science. We read other people on the internet. That said, because the internet is so huge, because there's loads of stuff out there, just because you're aware of a bubble doesn't mean you have to put stuff in it you don't like. Um, if there are trigger topics to you, if there are things that you can't deal with or you get angry about, you don't have to have arguments about them. You don't have to respond to people. I know that's quite controversial because people are always about it's about the dialogue and the conversation and so on and so forth, but you have a certain set of energy and a certain set of expertise. Pick the things that are really important. If they're the things you want to really fight with people about, you want to really discuss, you want to really get in there, then do it. And the other stuff, you can let it go. But it's an entirely personal example. I follow a lot of feminist stuff online, which means I'm exposed to an awful lot of misogyny and sexism. If I get that from historians of science, if they're saying something unproblematic about rape or domestic violence, I'll unfollow them. Right? It's a topic I care very deeply about, but that's just not the space in which I think I have my argument. So personally, that's the thing I get out of my feed that lowers my blood pressure and then gives me the strength to go and have a develop creationism or um, astrology or something else. Um, Dunning Kruger effect. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect is this theory in psychology that the less competent you are at a task, the more you overestimate your ability to do it. And equally, the more competent you are at a task, the more you underestimate your own ability to do it. So the, you know, the intelligence is supposed to be full of doubt and the student full of confidence. I'm not sure how much that actually applies to it, but I think it does apply a little bit to self-promotion, in that most of the academics I talk to and in fact other bloggers, feel kind of awkward and embarrassed about the amount of self-promotion they have to do to get anyone to come in with their blog or their Twitter feed. So as a general rule of thumb, I mean, if you don't advertise it, people generally won't come. I mean, that's, I think, true of academic research as well, and I'm not sure we're ever encouraged to promote it quite as much as we need to, but that's around for another time. Um, 
But generally, I think if you're feeling slightly awkward and embarrassed about the amount of perfection you're doing with your blog, you're probably not doing enough. On the other hand, if you're thinking, I'm really discreet and everything is fine, then probably you're on the other side of that and you're doing way too much. <laughs> And then finally, a blog is not an article. I, I have ranted about this already today. It's a lunchtime session of all blogging is for. So one of the saddest things I find is when someone has written a blog and it's 2,000 words and it's got footnotes and it's basically a small research essay. There are loads of places for research essays, like journals and books and journals. The internet has so much more potential. There is so much more you can do it. Even if it's just putting proper links in, don't have a footnote. Have a link to the open access journal so people can click through and find it. You don't need to reference it because it's not like an article. At the same time, you also need to um, be more confident probably about what an expert you are. Um, it's very easy to end up only feeling confident writing about elephants and the areas of expertise. But actually, everyone in this room is an expert in history of science technology you know, in its broadest sense. And we're all in a position to be able to write intelligently about that because of the background reading that we've done. So push your expertise. It's not a research article. It's a blog post. It's a Twitter post. These are things that we know an awful lot more about than most people, and we can afford to be confident in our mind. Thank you very much, Nessa. Um, right, moving swiftly on, we're going to hop over to Nottingham, um, and um, hopefully something will appear, um, and I hope Alice Bell will be the first speaker. Hello. Hello. <laughs> can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, hello, I'm going to. Hello, Manchester. <laughs> and um, hello, Nottingham. Um, I guess I'm here. I can talk for several different people. <laughs> right, all right. I'm just going to talk without that weird echo. I hope yeah, this works. Um, I, I can come here with several different hats on, so I'm going to talk briefly about those. I'm going to keep these brief just to tell you a bit about what I've done and some things that I've found um, so that we, these things can come out in questions, maybe. Um, first of all, I should say I'm an academic who studies science communication and academics interacting with the public. Uh, and one of the things I've studied is bloggers and blogging and academics, academics talking online. Um, but I am also an academic who does that, uh, which is an awful lot of time spent up my own bottom thinking about these things. And I'm going to talk a bit about both. I'll talk first, and I'll also say that I'm a practitioner, and I have been a practitioner of doing science communication, not as an academic. I've been working, talking about science online, and writing web content in different places since about 2000. So I've been doing this for a reasonably long time, considering the age of the web. Um, and uh, I suppose I can talk a bit about that too. I just want to say a few points about some research I've done and then a little bit about my own personal experience about being an academic blogger. Uh, just to start off with the research, um, I did a small research project a couple of years ago looking at people who blog about the brain. And I chose the brain because it's an interesting area. It's not really a, well, it's an area of academic research, but it's one that many different academics look at. It's also one that people who aren't academics would write about. It's an area where there's a lot of controversies around the media presentations of it, which means that academics are sometimes led to blog about it to set things right compared to what was in the newspaper. So there's interesting reasons why academics might come to talk about it as well. And you get patients and people who have things they want to talk about their own brain uh, that all come together and they sometimes work together interestingly in a community in this particular field of, of sort of practice or um, topic. It's an interesting boundary object within science blogging. And I, so I talked to, I interviewed some interviews and, and talked to people who uh, were professional scientists in many different disciplines, anthropologists, historians, philosophers, ethicists, patients, professional science writers, and people who'd started writing about all sorts of topics and just to come across the brain as something interesting, as well as people who came much more from the science writing perspective. And one of the things I found was a huge diversity as to why they started blogging. But the two, I think, most interesting questions I asked them is, why did you start blogging and why did you stay? And with the, why did you start, a lot of them it was just, oh, I thought I'd try it. One person explicitly said, it was the anniversary of Darwin, uh, it was the Darwin 200, and he felt that this would be some kind of uh, celebration of Darwin. Uh, so after all the Darwin correspondence letters, he wrote a correspondence project, he felt inspired and thought there would be a modern day version of that. Someone else said they really liked some jazz writing and wanted to try that for science. Uh, it's curious, you know, the writers are curious about it. There were a few academics who said they just hated peer review and they really loved the idea of being able to self-publish, the sense of liberation. But then what came up predominantly in terms of why people uh, stayed writing was the social interactions they got. 
well, there's two points. One was the social interaction. So you've got to go thinking, I'm going to push stuff out into the world. Some of the academics said, I read this thing in the newspaper, and it was terrible, and I just had to go and tell everybody, instead of writing a letter to the newspaper, instead of being angry with Tombridge Wells, I was angry on the internet. And I had an audience of anger, and people would listen to it, it was exciting. But then what, came, what kept me going was that they found that audience. Sometimes it, they felt that it had some kind of social impact, that maybe the journalist responded to that sort of relationship. Or it's just that they found other interested people that they would uh, read as well as write. They would read the comments and interact with them, but that they would also read other blogs. And in fact, several of them said it really caught on when Twitter happened alongside blogging. It gave them a feeling of who their community was. And they could see people reading it. They could, they could see their blog posts being shared by other people. So even if someone didn't leave a comment, they knew that they had an audience. And that felt very appealing, especially to the academics who put these papers out, even if if you're lucky five people read your paper, you won't necessarily know that they've read it or who they are. You can see a bit of that. That was uh, an exciting thing for a lot of people. The other thing that kept people blogging was almost antisocial or asocial, not antisocial, asocial. It was almost, it didn't really matter if anyone read. And this reflects some other research that's been done onto bloggers that says that people sometimes, they like writing in public, the idea that someone might read it. It doesn't really matter who it is, and they're not really in for it. It's the process of writing that they get something out of, rather than the interaction afterwards. And some people felt there was a place where they could sit in the scientists and the professional writers. It was a place where they could try stuff out. They could think through things. I think a lot of us may identify with this idea. I was once accused by this uh, by one of my old tutors, that I think by writing. And I, that's probably why I blog is that it helps me think through things if I write it. And I can do that myself. I have piles of notes. And one of the reasons why I started blogging was just to liberate that from the, um, my laptop. I thought I could share it with more people. Um, that there were some useful notes that I had. It wasn't just my ideas, but my recording of other people's ideas. Um, but it was that just knowing that someone could read it, it kind of makes you do it better. You have those uh, imaginary people watching. And sometimes that can be limiting. You worry, oh, I don't want to write this because then I have to fight with someone. And you have to think about how you fit into that social system. But sometimes it can be really useful and helpful in positive ways. So it's almost it, the public nature of it is important, but it's as if no one's there. Uh, and that was alongside the, the fact that people stayed because of the community. Uh, finally, I just wanted to say that I've done some training with scientists about blogging, and quite often people go, I'm scared, I'm scared of like, the reaction. I think Vanessa has reflected on this with her comment about arguing, and a lot of people have talked about arguing. Um, and as particularly with professional scientists, I find them saying, oh, I'm worried about the climate skeptics, or the anti vaxxers or the animal rights people, some activist group that they're being scared by. And I've really been puzzled for a long time about what to say with that, because I understand why they're a bit fearful, and I can see how it could be a bit of a time suck, but I also feel that they should listen to groups that disagree with them, and I feel as an academic that I've got a lot out of disagreeing with people online, and in other public engagement work that I would do. I'd also say, as a public, as a communications person, that we shouldn't just limit ourselves to online interaction. There are other places that we should um, go and do public interaction on. Uh, but I, I find that the disagreeing is a really productive thing. That's one of the reasons why I'm an academic. I like arguing, and I like arguing with people who aren't just academics. But sometimes you can see how you get pulled down particular arguments. And I have been uh, having quite a few arguments or being targeted with people who want to argue with me on um, particularly climate in the last few months. And some of that's been actually quite emotionally draining. It's caused me to cry and have sleep at night. It's been really quite difficult. Um, and one response to that is that I'm being too sensitive and I need to kind of man up a bit. And some people react to it like that. Uh, and others is that they're wrong and I should criticise them. Um, another is I should just cut them out and ignore them. But I do also feel that I get something out of their dis uh, disagreement. The sort of balance that I've come to now is that I will avoid interacting with some of them because it's just, it, I also feel it's a time suck away from interacting with other people I might have other disagreements with and there's a limit, there's a finite amount of time that I have. I sort of take on a case by case basis who I would disagree with and I know that's a judgment in myself and that's really bad and I don't, I really don't know what the solution is to that because you're doing all these things you're telling other people, you, know, you need to be more open, you need to think about who you're disagreeing with, uh, but you do have to judge them. And I, I think so, I would be interested to know what, if other people have had similar experiences, how they've dealt with it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's an ongoing problem. And what do you do when you have the kind of disagreement which you feel has got too much? And at what point do you feel it's too much? And how do you judge that? And what systems do we have to support people in place within academia to be able to help people through that? Because when I had this problem, my boss came to say, you know, can I help you with this? Do I need to like go and tell him off or something? And I was like, you know, you don't need to save me from these people. I can deal with it myself. But also, just telling me to ignore them, I didn't think was productive. I wanted a way to make this. Mm -hmm. useful and I'd be very open to that. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Sorry, we lost you. Um, Greg, we're nearest to me. Um, could we have Greg speaking next? Uh, okay, so, so I'm going to read to, as a result of that and in the spirit of the day, uh, references and whatnot. I'll make text available online. I'm sure that will be tweeted uh, just for references and whatnot. Okay, so uh, after being nominated as the human link between science in the public and the International Congress for the History of Science, Technology and Medicine, where I'm speaking tomorrow afternoon, uh, I initially said I'd try and come up with something called Making Science for the People of Public, asking some questions of public engagement and social media in the context of the sociobiology controversies of the 1970s. Um, for two reasons, I'm going to keep that influence largely, if not entirely, implicit. Uh, firstly, because of mundane time constraints, but more importantly, because I'm a senior to to my left, uh, wrote a piece for The Guardian last week which addresses these radical science movements in more depth and more thought than I'm going to be able to. Uh, so instead, I'll draw from to alternative sources. So the first of those is a book by Jody Dean called Blog Theory, which offers a critique of social media and which was subject to a day-length discussion at the university's Center for Critical Theory some months ago. Uh, I'm aware of the irony of using critical theory in a discussion about public communication. But anyway. um, and secondly, I'll follow uh, a strategy which Nick Rose has endorsed in relation to the SM5, uh, which offers up not questions, but instead only difficult, uh, sorry, not answers, but instead only difficult questions. Okay, so question one. Does social media lead to greater clarity? This is something which Jodie Dean, uh, in language borrowed borrow from Japan, argues strongly against. She argues, quote, there has been a decline in symbolic efficiency within the realms of social media. media. Dean states that, quote, if the efficiency of a symbol designates its mobility, its ability to transmit significance not simply from one person to another, but from one setting to another, the decline of symbolic efficiency points to an immobility and failure of transmission. Blogs provide a clear example. Sometimes it's hard to tell when a blog or a post is ironic, when it's sincere, when it's funny, when it's serious. And I'm sure this experience of losing symbolic efficiency is one familiar to all of us who have used the various forms of social media. So without firmly endorsing this claim of humanism, I do wonder if a recasting of space is in some sense responsible for any loss of efficiency. Space is a reoccurring methodological concern for science and technology studies. Dewey, like Steve Woolgar, uh, has advocated keep an ironic distance from our scientific subjects lest we be beguiled by their truth claims. Or Dewey, like Karen Barad or the keynote we've just heard here at Science of Public, Harry Collins, get far closer to our subject matter and attempt to re-engage in a meaningful way. So, following on from Alice, my research is into cognitive neuroscience and cognitive neuroscientists. Uh, I'm part of a, as well, it's been based on science and technology studies. I'm part of a lab uh, in the psychology department. Um, and it does seem to be the case, unsurprisingly, that the more one speaks to neuroscientists, the more messy and nuanced their decisions become. And such a general phenomenon has, of course, been spoken about for centuries. But the question is, when I engage someone on Twitter, is am I a Bulgarian or a Barack? Certainly, I'm close to the neuroscientists to the extent that I or they can cause offence, but I'm not convinced either of us is truly close enough to understand the other's position. Maybe, in fact, this is a concept which fails to capture the nature of this relationship at all. I'm not sure that mess does really come across in 140 characters, but there's obviously plenty of space for four-letter words. Uh, question two, is there the same degree of risk associated with social media? Do Twitter storms, in some sense, replace direct action? Are other forms of debate, dissidents, and so forth quelled within the philosophy? Is revolutionary language used for academic, personal, or financial gain with only minimal associated cost? This, of course, is dominant critique of social media, that we no longer actively protest, or indeed wander down the, uh, wander down the hill into our colleagues' offices and have a chat, but instead engage at a comfortable distance. This would be the critique that Julie Cristeva is now blogging with Langdon Winner about bridges rather than joining Michel Foucault in throwing stones from the top of them. And the fear that if E.O. Wilson had written the new synthesis today, there would be not so much a fear of being doused with water or coming out of a corpse in the elevator, but of trending on Twitter. And final question three is, does social media facilitate democracy? Now, I'm on dangerous ground here because my knowledge of political theory is probably surpassed by everyone else in this room and the various other cities engaging. Uh, I've written here, assuming democracy is a good thing, but again, after the keynote in Science and Public, that's apparently a dangerous assumption. Uh, assuming it is a good thing, there is surely social media's strongest hand. The idea that, uh, at the very least, the capacity of individuals and organisations to blog, tweet, organise and 
engaged to determine who speaks and about what seems to be endlessly improved by these novel media. But to quote from this panel's abstract, we know that Stephen Jay Gould did indeed appreciate, quote, the importance of listening and two-way communication rather than simply broadcasting, and conversed with hundreds, if not thousands, of readers, both lay and academic, during his time as essayist at Natural History Magazine. Sometimes these discussions lasted years. Uh, similarly, we know that organizations became intimately engaged with science and social media. Uh, at the Nottingham Contemporary Art Gallery last spring, I was confronted by a headline which was Black Genocide, Sickle Cell Anemia, in a copy of the Black Panther Intercommunal News Service from 1971. And that headline topped an article engaged with science and medicine in a particularly sophisticated way. Uh, I considered that topic briefly in a review to Science and Culture and Alondra Nelson's book, Body and Soul, shows just how central the issue of scientific and medical knowledge was to the Black Power movement. And so the point here is not to say that democracy, democracy has not been facilitated. Instead, it suggests that it's not a straightforward issue. Uh, so these are the questions, clarity, risk, and democracy. Uh, they're not questions which I'm attempting to answer, but they are important. Thank you. Great. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so today I thought I'd just introduce um, a, quite a new project that I'm working on that seeks to investigate public understanding, experiences, and memories of local weather. Specifically, the experiences and impacts of snow and unusually severe winter weather. And thinking about how they can be captured, represented, and shared through social media tools. The project is based in two sites in Cumbria and Mid Wales and will prioritise the community as a focus. The ultimate aim being to build up digital visualisations of a number of past winters. A blog will be the primary means of documenting the project as it develops and of inviting contributions from communities in these areas and beyond, particularly thinking about past residents and regular visitors to those case study areas. So weather appears to be quite a hot topic on social media, and this probably follows its general popularity as a conversation topic, certainly in Britain. As Gordon Manley, a climatologist and geographer, his work on snow frames our project, declared in 1952, if a census were taken of common topics of conversation among British people, it is very probable that weather would take first place. Um, and I found some research online that suggested, Twitter suggested that in 2009, people were sending more than 200 tweets per minute about the weather. Weather's online presence also speaks to, I think, um, probably the, recent, the current heat wave, um, recent harsh winters, and the role of the amateur observer in the development of meteorology as a science, in the creation of the historic weather record, and the continuing prominence of the amateur in weather and climate monitoring. It's only um, around in the last decade or so that automated weather stations have become commonplace in amateur observers observers' gardens and linked, linked up to their laptops, these offer easy data sharing through websites like Weather Underground and the Weather Observations website, which act as hubs for the sharing of this data, that problems relating to reliability and standardization considered has great potential to be of use for wider communities. Social media tools then act as a facility by which these measurements and other more basic observations increase the spatial resolution of the UK's observing network. Another example um, of the latter is hashtag UK Snow, which since 2009 has been keeping track of snowfall in the UK. The interactive map uses geotagged or postcode labelled tweets, often with accompanying photos, to draw an up to the minute picture of current snowfall adding a personal touch to forecasts which are now typically reliant on unmanned stations. Social media can also play an integral part in the dissemination of information about severe weather events and as a more general tool to prompt conversation with the public on all matters weather related, making meteorological science public. As my project and the blog are in their very early stages, I wanted today to think, um, take more of a historical perspective and look at a couple of examples of historic um, crowdsourcing projects, you might call them, and look to have a think about the sources and methods they used and see if we can combine things with social media today. So at one of the first meetings of the newly formed Association for the Study of Snow and Ice, 
held in October 1937, members noted that remarkably little information was available with regard to the frequency with which the higher uplands of Britain were covered with snow. Accordingly, the association developed, decided that a minor but important part of its work was to try and fill this gap. And they drew up a simple scheme um, by which a number of observers in mountainous districts were to be asked to send in a weekly printed postcard on which a record was made each morning stating whether snow fell at the, sa at the station and whether or not snow lay at the station at various elevations. The papers of the association indicate that the survey started with just 14 observers, each being identified through personal networks, who in 1938-39 between them sent in 250 postcard records to the survey. The national survey was thus established, but unfortunately the year 1938 as a whole gave less snow than any other in that century, so it was difficult to maintain interest. With the outbreak of war the following year, the survey suffered further disruption and a temporary halt, but resumed post-war in the winter of 1946-47, to 47. and that survey was based on the work of some 120 volunteer observers and captured the extreme and often remembered conditions of February 1947, when weather of excessive severity prevailed throughout the country. In response to the publication of this survey, um, one of its organisers said that it has to be remembered that weather memories, even among meteorologists, are short, so that recent experiences tend to be overestimated. And the survey continued until 1991 to 1992. Um, so to conclude, I just wanted to um, give you some more questions that I've been pondering in thinking about whether postcard surveys and also newspaper appeals for memories, which was another technique used by this group, still have value or appeal in the social media age, and indeed whether they could be used in combination in some way. I've also been thinking about how a snowless winter this year might affect our project and engagement with it. How might memory and history mix with social media ventures into the weather? And will online sharing discussion help to improve the reliability of those weather memories that are shared, and particularly the ability to date them? So if there are more people contributing, whether they can accurately remember when that winter happened. And through digitally reconstructing the events of past winters, will we be better prepared for future ones? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks to all our speakers. Um, okay, so Matt. Okay, I think Warren is. Uh, um, Nathaniel, uh, are you there? Can you hear me? Very... There's Nathaniel Comfort yeah. of um, yes. Hopkins University. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Nathaniel may or may not be wearing trousers, but he's going <laughs> on. <laughs> yes, so thank you. Um, I, my remarks, I think, are going to amplify a lot of the, the things that, are, uh, that have been said this morning, and um, I hope bring some a uh, couple of different perspectives on it. Um, I want to talk about blurring the lines uh, as a kind of an, an exercise in, in social deconstruction. Um, before I got interested in uh, and partic started participating in social media, I had several more or less well-defined communities that I interacted with. Uh, these were first people I mostly listened to, uh, scientists, physicians, genetic counselors. By the way, I should just say for anybody who doesn't know my work, what I do is the, uh, I study contemporary, uh, the, the history of genetics and genomics. So I do a lot of, of work with uh, oral histories, interviews, um, you know, a lot of contemporary stuff. So there are people I mostly listen to, scientists, physicians, genetic counselors, and so forth, um, plus journalists uh, who often write rough drafts of parts of my stories. Um, second, people who mostly listen to me, uh, patients, policy makers, some scientists and physicians who were not practicing at the moment but were reading me instead, uh, as well as the, uh, the, you know, the proverbial educated lay reader who we all hope yeah. exists out there someplace. Uh, and third, people who I converse with more or less mutually, historians, sociologists, philosophers, bioethicists, and so forth. 
social media blurs those li the lines among those different communities in fascinating and, and occasionally rather troubling ways. Um, so I follow the, the top science writers uh, in, uh, in the U.S. and in Britain, and a good number of them follow me as well. And so from them, I learn about the stories that they're working on. I often know about uh, new scientific results and, and, and stories that are going to hit the papers several days before they hit the newspapers, which uh, is great because it gives me a chance to start thinking about uh, a blog piece or so something about it. Um, and they, from me, get some historical context on their work. And it's, there have been a number of uh, instances where I have chimed in with something, some bit of historical knowledge or a reference or a book or something that, uh, th that a science writer hasn't known about and has helped inform their work. So we also have conversations. We get into arguments uh, you know, uh, about things like uh, uh, um, what kind of phraseology to use in popular science writing, whether you should use, you know, I, I make a lot of, uh, 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 I write a lot of diatribes about the use of, of language, you know, the gene for uh, obesity or schizophrenia or being drunk or whatever. Uh, and I like to get on people's cases about stuff like that. Um, I'm also, uh, I follow and am followed by scientists and clinicians. And again, I learn about research uh, from them often in advance. And re reciprocally, I provide historical context to them. And there have been a lot of times when I've brought historical work to the attention of a lab scientist or a clinician, and they've gone and looked it up and, 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 uh, and, and deepened their, their work. And in fact, I just read an article, a review article, for a scientist at Cold Spring Harbor who, who asked, my, uh, asked my feedback. That kind of thing wouldn't have happened uh, in, in the old days or at least not as, not as frequently. Um, and then, of course, there's the lay public who are uh, perfectly free to read whatever I write. And again, I'm interested in, in the popular culture of science. So there's research there for me in their responses to my work. Uh, it, so it, it kind of blurs the lines between doing research and, 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 and talking about it. Um, but also, I reach. Through, through social media, I reach people that I'm very interested in reaching. I've sold real physical books through my tweeting, Facebooking, blog posts, and so forth. Um, I have what's considered a modest Twitter following. Uh, about the, uh, about the, the same number follow me on Twitter as attend the American Association for the History of Medicine meeting. Um, Becky Higgett has about 3,900 followers, as last time I checked, or more than double the attendees at, uh, at, at uh, the Manchester meeting there. So there, there really is a potential for, for a great audience. Um, and of course, these people are not just readers, they're writers as well. Uh, and they're not bound by the same codes of genteel discourse that govern our seminar rooms. Uh, and this, uh, this is, was brought up, I think, by, by Vanessa. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a blessing and a curse. Um, and, you know, these people do curse. They attack you ad hominem. They reason speciously. Uh, and so it gives you a little bit of a thicker skin. Uh, in in your in your intellectual discourses, uh, which you know, which has its 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 pluses and minuses, um, more blurring of lines. Uh, it blurs the lines between history and journalism, between the popular and the scholarly, between the professional and the amateur. Uh, again, these are these are points that have that other people have touched on briefly, uh, but I just want to emphasize this this kind of breaking down of of conventional barriers. Um, there are some troubling aspects to to these uh, th this breaking down of, of barriers. Um, it's entirely possible that we are currently, as a society, reinventing the credit system in academic writing. Uh, blog posts are not journal articles; it's true, uh, but some serious scholarship does come out online. Uh, my guess is that academic journals as we know them will cease to exist in some non-huge number of years from now. Um, but until such heaven or hell, depending on, you, uh, on your perspective, uh, arrives, it's very expensive 
for students and non-tenured faculty to write the kind of long-form scholarship that would replace journals. Uh, people do it. Becky, Darren, Patrick McRae, the folks at Nursing Clio, and, and many others. But it's expensive to do this because we don't yet put these essays on our CVs. So we have to balance balance our time. Uh, how willing are we to, to put the hours that it takes to write a really high quality long form blog post uh, when we don't when we don't yet get credit for it. Um, I think that this is probably part of a sweeping overhaul of copyright that's going to hit sooner or later. I'm trying, you know, I'm drawing in here not only academic writing but also, you know, popular music, book publishing, and so forth. We're going to be reinventing copyright law sometime in the not too not too distant future. And it's interesting to 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 play some small part in that and to get to watch it in real time. I think this is uh, a, a very interesting issue in the history of, of, uh, of technology and the history of the book. And so we get to watch this in real time. Um, and that's, you know, that's very troubling in a lot of ways, but it's also fascinating. And the final thing I would mention uh, as far as troubling aspects is triviality. Uh, because of uh, the perceived cost of long-form scholarship, there's a tendency towards short-form writing. Uh, and by short-form, I mean everything from half-formed thoughts that we toss up on our blog to pot shots taken on Twitter. Uh, and so there's, there's some pressure toward less reflective, uh, less well-documented kind of history. And um, I don't think that's necessarily fatal but it but it is a pressure and I think and I think it's a danger uh, there, there is some risk of, of of reducing the overall rigor and reflectiveness of uh, of our scholarship so that's about my five minutes um, so I'll turn it over to the to the next person thanks Thank you very much that's great uh, and our final uh, speaker is Darren Hayton um, who uh, but some sort of the earlier period of history, which I wonder if it makes some interesting differences. He's from Hayden College. Can can everybody hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, good. I, I apologize for the, the tardy arrival. There was uh, despite being a historian of science, I was flummoxed by my technology. Uh, so I wanted to start by picking up on some of the things that Nathaniel just spoke of. In particular, the ways in which uh, a historian, such as myself, uh, will use blog posts or will use Twitter, and what effect that has on long form, short form, how much reflection we put into, or at least I put into, a post or a tweet. Um, I think that there's a real issue here about credit, and that credit is not just official credit, whether or not we put these posts on our CV, but that credit is also an informal credit, whether or not uh, our faculty colleagues respect or or appreciate uh, or denigrate or look down on tweets, blog posts, and the like. Uh, I have uh, a blog that I gets reasonable uh, traffic for an academic history of science blog, uh, but I do try. Uh, I make a real effort to to have my posts that I put up there. Certainly, the ones that are of any considerable length have some reflection in them. I don't want them just to be, oh, this is an interesting thought, let me throw it up there. And part of that is a, a self-imposed censoring because I know that many of my colleagues here uh, at Haverford um, question the, the worth and merit of social media of all sorts uh, and speak in dismissively of, of blogs, Twitter, uh, and, and the like. I clearly wish that that were different. Uh, what I think this points to, again, is picking up on some of the, the themes that other people have, have raised. It, it points to a blurring of lines uh, and an uncomfortable, for some people, um, new def definition of what it, what it might mean to be an academic and the spaces in which academics can, can speak. I'm particularly interested in those new spaces because I'm upset's too strong a word. I, I lament the fact that academics have a lot of interesting things to say and a lot of expertise 
And we don't, as a group, generally bring that expertise to bear in public discourse. I think blogs, Twitter, uh, those are the two social media I use because I don't push back any interesting boundaries in that way. But I think blogs and Twitters and the other forms of, of social media offer academics a venue in which they can engage uh, broader publics and begin to take part in conversations that are happening at, at the level of society, beyond the walls of, of the academies we all inhabit. Uh, I think that that's an important role that, that academics need to, uh, I'll be normative here, I think academics need to take take some of that space back. I think journalists, uh, policymakers, scientists, they're all very, very good at what they do, but they often lack the expertise that we can bring to bear. As Nathaniel pointed out, many times scientists and journalists benefit from the historical examples that he can bring. Uh, as somebody who works on a much earlier period and works on astrology and witchcraft and magic and stuff, rarely do I get scientists calling me and saying, hey, can you give me a, a historical account on this astrological prediction? But uh, I'd be happy to give them one. Uh, but what it, I, I do use my blog as an opportunity to, to uh, engage in some of these uh, articles that come out. Most recently, I shouldn't say most recent, one that's sort of in the works right now is uh, a post on Scientific American. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, excuse me, on Smithsonian. That is, frankly, uh, simplistic and naive. And I think that this is an opportunity for me to say, OK, this is why it's simplistic and naive. It's not that I disagree necessarily with your point, but you've made it badly. And let's think about how you could refine it. Uh, blogs, Twitter. It, it's that space that allows historians, historians of science in particular, well, all historians, but because I'm a historian of science, historians of science to engage with journalists, with uh, policymakers. The other place that I want to push this is too often the academy divides into those at an institution such as Johns Hopkins or, or Haverford or some other recognized uh, institution of higher learning and those in museums and public history spaces. That's another division that I'm uncomfortable with. Uh, I think that the people who are in the academy have, have every bit as much responsibility for engaging with publics uh, as those that we more typically call public historians and museum people. Um, and, and one way that we can do that is by fostering those, those venues, those avenues of communication through blog posts, through Twitter, uh, and and see what sort of avenues open up for us. I'm interested in all of these because I, at the end of the day, think academics have a lot to offer the public writ large. Uh, and I wish that academics would take more advantage of the spaces, the the channels that we have. I wish academics would get out beyond the, the confines of their their uh, academies, their institutions, and actually speak to publics. Uh, the last piece I want to say, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, is this is a process of conversation, not of, of speaking at, but speaking with. Uh, I have recently turned off comments on my blog for a variety of reasons. I don't think all conversations and, and blog comments are often the place I don't like this to happen. Not all conversations are, are facilitated or advanced by the half-baked uh, comments that I often see on, on blog posts or on articles. Um, but I would like to think that people who read my blog and are moved to disagree with me or to agree with me or ask for further elaboration will take the time either to post on their own blog, their own little corner of the internet, uh, and extend that conversation that way, raise real questions, criticize what I've said, and then give me an opportunity to reflect on and either admit that I'm wrong or, or try to clarify my thoughts. This is the type of, of conversation that I think can happen in social media. It allows it, social media allows it to extend beyond the lecture where I show up and I talk to an audience for 15 minutes and they ask me a few questions. This also allows it to extend in time, not just in space. Blog posts stay up for a long time and and people can come back and see them later. So to sum up, I, I think that 
the ways that we've thought about social media in this conversation so far are excellent. It blurs lines. It asks us to engage with people beyond our, our very narrow confines, our, our narrow walls. I would push that a little bit farther to say for me personally, and I think for I would like to see more historians take this on, I see that as an obligation, not just as, as another opportunity, but really as something we, we should, we historians and academics, we should be taking advantage of and doing what we can to bring our expertise into the broader public discussions. Thanks. Yeah? Hello. Uh, Becky, can't hear you. Hello. Uh, can I, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Um, I think the best option is if we um, pass back to Nottingham and I'll let Warren over there chair um, some discussion, any responses from the panel, any questions from the floor, um, and then they will be leaving us in about 15 minutes, and then once they've gone, we can continue that. Um, does that sound okay? Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so I don't know, has anyone got any questions or comments? Uh, from the floor here, or if you want to follow up on any of what was said here, shall I open the questions first? So, um, you will have, oh, I'm going to have to I'm move this over here. Do you want to shout? Yeah, and maybe people can relay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I suppose I have a question um, about teaching, which I don't think anybody has mentioned, perhaps. Um, but I wondered if people had experience of using social media in teaching and how that interacts with your social media presence more generally. Okay, so, uh, so a question about social media in teaching and whether anyone's got experience of that. Well, I, I set up a blog with Sarah when we were teaching together. <laughs> it, I don't think we tried to get the students to blog, to, to write blog posts. I wonder if that was a bit early. I wonder if now students would be a bit more open to that. I think it's worked in different ways. I know that Jack still goes offered space on his blog for he's got students to write blog posts and the best ones he's going to publish on his blog to give them a sense of um, space. I kind of think that social media should be a space that we can encourage students to have their own spaces on and not necessarily take use. Uh, I know when people have used things like I know so I've got colleagues that have used Facebook and stuff in teaching and they feel that students don't want to do that. That should be their space and they should have spaces away from from us that's not controlled, or you want to encourage them to talk about these sort of things within each other, within sort of social media. Social space is often seen as a social space for students. Social media is seen as a social space for students, and we don't want to interfere in that. It's like going and trying to run a reading group in the union. Um, but I have seen, certainly, I think a lot of people will probably find that they found students using blog posts in their writing, and they'll cite them. There was a piece in Times Higher last week saying that it's terrible that PhDs now reference blog posts, and this is a disgusting lack of scholarship. This is from a media studies academic, and I frankly would have thought that she would, should know better, that there is scholarship out there, I think, as Nathaniel said, and we should expect to see that, alongside other things. And I would want students to be able to reflect on the difference between a blog post and a peer-reviewed article, and critically assess when what they are better and worse than each other for a particular thing. But I often see students using a blog post, and sometimes it's better than a peer-reviewed paper for a particular topic, and I think we should encourage that and see that in teaching. That's engaged, so talking earlier about credits, you know, possibly reinventing the form of credits in academia. So, and so this, this kind of all stuff happens in the rep as well, isn't it? This, yeah. this idea that you should read every piece and every article you know, critically and make a judgment based on, because obviously not all journal articles are of the same quality, but in yep. real life, that is also kind of a shorthand, isn't it? But a journal, art, a journal, the journal that it appears in is some shorthand to determining the quality of it. And just like I'd hope our ref panels would be more imaginative than to just look at the name of a particular journal, I want our students, and I expect actually students to be a lot cleverer than the ref panels, um, but they should be able to assess the difference of that for the particular essay they're writing. And again, and also someone assessing a PhD should certainly be more clever than a ref panel. Uh, anyone else on the panel want to come out? Any more questions, Peter? Uh, yeah, I find it quite curious that both Darren and Nathaniel have a backdrop of talks behind them. <laughs> 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 that 
that's consciously trying to continue the trope that goes through any of my books. Um, and is there any, is there any implications of it? Uh, okay, I'm going to turn the mic up first. So. Uh, Darren, you want to respond to this uh, observation? Um, that's that's yeah. called sitting at our desks. <laughs> yes, precisely. It, it's called, I wanted to sit while I did this as opposed to stand in a classroom where there are uh, computers with, with uh, cameras. Um, this is the space that I have. I can shut the door and I won't be, I won't be interrupted. If you'd like, uh, since it's a history of science conference, here's a old barometer I have. That is, <laughs> uh, it doesn't work anymore, but it's cute. Uh, no, I, I absolutely agree that there there's a concern about uh, you know the way in which we present ourselves and and yes I'm sitting in front of books uh, but it in this instance it happens to be a pragmatic issue I this is where I had a space that I could sit and and I wouldn't be disturbed uh, I don't as a rule uh, try to protect this image when I am writing a blog post or some other such thing in fact I. For a long time, the picture of me on my, my blog was me standing on some sculpture in Budapest looking like a, a goofball. Uh, so a long way from, from your standard academic picture. Okay. Uh, Nathaniel, do you want to uh, Yeah, sure, not, not a whole lot to add. I'm just sitting at my desk at home. And you know, I'm a historian. I have a lot of books around. So it just, <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> Um, I was interested in Nathaniel's point about um, the sort of challenge to the paper, um, and I saw a few people on Twitter disagreeing with it, um, and so I'm doing something I normally try and avoid doing, but I thought was relevant for this session which is follow along on Twitter while speaking but uh, I, I'm not sure if I, I think what we want to work for is a diversity of, of things I think Nathaniel kind of brought that out too and something I missed as a writer as an editor it's not I also miss peer reviews although it's really liberating not to have them it's also you learn from that even when you get a bad peer review it's like oh actually grudgingly you know that made it better for all the frustrations of peer review you can often get much something much better out of it too and I certainly miss an editor if anything I miss more since I started blogging at the Guardian and I can blog whatever I want I actually miss the lack of the journalist just being another eye to look at it and say ah oh, you should change this and I do editing of some other blog posts and I edit a lot for other websites that I work for and I think that you get better work, even if it's just another eye. It doesn't need to be this idea of peers really judging your work in a, an extreme way. But there's an improvement that happens through drafts that involve other people. The social net nature of making text, I think we lose sometimes in blogging. Although we're also liberated and do much better things because of it too. And it would be nice to have within the diversity of the ecosystem of, of different types of publishing that we have. I'd like to have that. And I wondered if anyone else has similarly felt that gasp in that they miss it. I could chime in on that. Um, you know, I would just for the sake of argument, I would uh, I, I would push a little a little harder than than maybe I would in a reasonable uh, you know a, a reflective piece, and say that a lot of uh, a lot of social media, more long form stuff, is peer reviewed. Um, you know, I I have pushed Darren to open up comments on, on some of his blog posts uh, because let's face it with a lot of our stuff it's fairly it's fairly arcane most of the people who are going to be reading us probably are historians and and we are getting and I know a lot of the people who are going to be commenting on on my my stuff and um, yes you filter out some noise but a lot of the folks who are who, who are chiming in are reviewing our own work so I would say it is it, or at least it can be a, a new form of peer review that has, you know, conventional peer review has its downsides. It has uh, everybody has had experiences probably with uh, with papers being rejected because you weren't part of the in club and, and so forth. So you know, I, I would I would push for a for for not a rejection but at least a reconsideration of the purposes of peer review and the forms in which we can get what we're trying to get out of peer review. Okay. Anyone in uh, Manchester want to respond to that? 
Vanessa, do you have anything to respond to on either that or any of the other things that we've heard? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the peer review, I mean, I, I, I appreciate what Alice is saying, that it's, I don't think it's so much the getting the peer review once you put the piece up, it's that nervousness of putting it out there in public while it's still not ready yet. And that is something that's quite hard to get over when you're doing an individual blog. I think perhaps when you're doing group blogs, there's the possibility of sharing a little more, which is useful. Um, and when I say a blog post isn't an article, it's not it's not to blanket and then long written uh, long reads on blogs because I do read them and I do enjoy them. It's more that what I want to try and do is encourage people, especially people who are just starting out with a blog, to explore all of the possibilities that that blog gives you. That it doesn't just have to be research articles; it can be digest and aggregate uh, uh, aggregators and reviews, and it can be links and all sorts of things. And it's more to encourage people to think about all of the other things you can also do with the blog, as well as dumping a really good essay on there. So it's not it's not blanket, it's more this is a very diverse medium and you will not get as much out of it as you could do unless you use all of the little things that it can possibly do for you. I'd say that I mean um, very different things are uh, trying to get a wider audience reading what you're writing versus getting um, any kind of peer review type friends back from your own discipline. I mean, can those two things actually be done on the same blog, or how do you signal what's for who, or do you need two blogs if you're actually doing that, in which case, how have any of us got enough time <laughs> to do any of this? But I guess each person chooses their own approach on these, right? Okay, uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Say <laughs> hi. She would post a blog, write a post anonymously for three days. Messages are either sent to what's person science communication, which are in this pretty this blog. And you get blind peer review. But after three days, and I published, but you have the blind, because people respond very quickly, and maybe the issue of peer review could be solved. It's not so many, much difficult, but it will be similar to the academic peer review. Because they don't, don't know you, they're anonymous. Okay, so that's a question about the possibility of finding an anonymous blog post in some case advocating. It wouldn't be the case of the response of the community. You have to tell them to I think that's interesting. And I've done some stuff that encouraging people to uh, do drafts of things. You put something out and then. You write a blog post and you get the comments back. And then Daniel's saying it's peer reviewed, it's a post publication peer review. But then you do a second draft, which might be the one that you publish in print or in another place. And you're suggesting we do it anonymously, so you've got a blind peer review in that way. I think the problem with that, though, is that the way in which you get the stuff out there often comes with your own identity. And I've done one of the things that came out of the brain blogger stuff was looking at synonymous bloggers who work, so you can't tell who they are. And one of the really interesting things about that is you actually do know a lot about them. So they, you don't know their name, you don't, you don't know where they work or what they do, you don't want their sort of real life identity. They do have a very, very trust, you can trust a synonymous blogger more than one that you know their real life identity. A really good example of this is um, Psycurious, who's now come out, we know who she is, but um, she showed her other identity. But for a long time, she worked as a postdoc, and she would criticise what it's like to be a postdoc. And you knew that you could kind of trust her more because she wasn't worried about uh, putting that against her other identity. She could criticise what it was like without, um, you know, she wasn't self-censoring. And I, I think that that sort of thing. Well, if you had a, set, if you had the platform, was why people went there. So you had a big blog, like I suppose if they post it on the platform of The Guardian or, or some other one that you've built up institutionally, your university work, website, it might work. But so often the blogs are coming with identities. And that's maybe not something that we've reflected on as much today, but we could do more, which is this way in which when academics become bloggers, you get a new form of popularization, sort of attachment to the person, which we've seen previously before with other forms of popularization. But it's problematic. And it, I know I've also talked to a lot of academics who blog, who say, especially on Twitter, they go, it's really tiring. I feel like I always have to be on. So I have to answer all the questions all the time. And sort of really leads into your personal life. Which is a difficult thing. Okay. Uh, anyone else got any responses to that? Um, I guess, um, so we, Alice, we've heard about climate change, and what I've noticed was, um, uh, so a lot of climate skeptics were anonymous blogs, 
and because of that, they're not treated. That's used, that is used as an excuse, one excuse not to treat them mm. seriously because they're kind of hiding behind this sort of limited. If that at this kind of climate communication conference, I saw some people defining trolls, i.e., people being ignored as they were always anonymous. Yeah. So, of course, they would say they don't want to come out because you know, some of them may be not in climate science, but maybe adjacent to that, and all the climate mm. game stuff was. Kind of fed into that as well, but yeah, that thing about anonymity and being taken seriously. And if you see someone's like the same, uh, see someone's face with some books behind them online, that's a kind of a sign of a, a real academic. But if it's this kind of you know, a kind of a random picture taken off the internet, sometimes these are sometimes they're like not to be taken seriously. Can I just respond to that? Yeah, I, I, I accept the point you're making, yeah. it can be valuable, but there are. The structural process of the creation of software is to manage and make it great by corporate interest, but actually, it's not just one uh, No, no, yeah. the next I think that the synonymous and anonymous thing in skepticism would be really interesting to compare the skeptics in the pub, sort of pro science skeptics, with these climate skeptic ones, and also where. If you, when you can, find out where the sort of proper things start. Because you get accusations of that on both sides, because there's huge numbers of people who do want to do that, astroturfing on both areas and around both areas. Um, but there are there are ways in which the synonymous identity in somebody like Gimpy is allowed to exist in a very different way, certainly in terms of scientific credibility, although I do know when people fight with him, they do accuse him of being a big farmer shill and all sorts of things, um, compared to around climate. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so we are almost time for us to wrap up here as we're uh, slightly out of sync. So, and if anyone's got any last comments, or if anyone in the room's got a last comment to make? Okay. Can I just ask from our end, is there anyone um, in this room who would like to ask something from the Nazi people, because they're about to uh, depart from the conversation. Um, is there anyone who's got a burning question for that lot before we discuss it? Not at present. Okay. Um, I think we'll wake up. Goodbye to Nottingham, if that's okay. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. And um, if I can ask Darren and Nathaniel to stay on as long as they can manage to understand what's being discussed in here, or if they've got any. Well, uh, um, we have the tea and coffee outside now, and then 15. <laughs> um, okay. um, do we have a mic for? Mm -hmm. um, to me, Vanessa or Daniel or Darren or um, just any comments, any thoughts about what is um, being discussed? Yeah. What did you come off methodologies in terms of how it changes and how you write about certain topics in the history of science. One thing I have is very uh, beneficial is to combine the known with the unknown with that. I particularly what everybody can also reference things like what particular thing I found very helpful is Star Trek for explaining sociology of scientific knowledge and symmetry. Uh, and if, you know, you look at the phones in the 90s and they didn't have to take on that that, that book technology people wanted communicators or like a lot of people experimenting with the non-based metal scans will actually cite Star Trek as one of the things that got them really interested in that. And a lot of the time, very beneficial results of like, talking about these popular culture things in the context of popularization of science, particularly the internet, the mean space and whatnot, is this combination of the, the known with the unknown. I think a lot of people would be much more critical of the, like you're just saying science is made up stance when they're confronted with something that they do or are familiar with in Star Trek, which they recognize as fictional, but still has had impact on the world. It helps smooth the transition of a lot of ideas which people might otherwise find unhelpful. And that's something that will likely you know, the speakers here today have you know, taken a hold of in the way that they present their own uh, ideas and work. Okay, so um, just for uh, the other guys, that was a, a comment really about um, methodology in making 
poses of work for a range of readers, I guess. And um, the idea of comparing known things with um, the unknown. With one post or an article actually that I read recently that does that, I was talking about social media comparing with coffee houses in the 17th century, and that that um, did very well and, and had that it had a hook for people. They totally knew what was being said from that. Um, the message of the thoughts on that. No, but I think it's an, a, a useful example. I think probably what Nathaniel does is, is perhaps slightly close to that of taking, when you're working in popular culture, being able to actually point to specific cases where a particular fictional thing has had a direct effect. Technology is probably easier to point to than others. They look, this is how it happened. And it does ease the social construction of this conversation that you then want to have. Yes, it's definitely useful. Yeah. Um, Nathaniel, do you want to add to that? Um. Sure. One, one, uh, one, one other technique that that I use that, that I think relates to this is, um, you know, we can use more forms of writing in in the freer world of social media than you can often do in in a journal. So one thing one thing that I like to use is satire, and uh, so. I just make shit up sometimes, you know, and uh, but but there's but but there's always a point to it. It's not just mockery. Uh, I I when I when I write a satirical point uh, piece, there's there's always a, a a point that that comes out of my history of science and medicine training, and I'm trying to trying to get that across in a way that. Uh, that, that, that will be accessible and maybe make people laugh and maybe get them to think about things in a little bit different way. Absolutely. Um, Derek, did you want to add anything? Uh, yeah. So the way that I generally try to hook my posts or what I'm thinking to uh, topics that everybody, more people understand, I look for articles with some issue. Uh, most recently I was thinking about the article that connected earthquakes to injection of, of fluids around fracking. Uh, and this gives me an opportunity, as Nathaniel said, to write in ways, to talk in ways that I don't get in academic journals. And I can say something like, well, this is really interesting, but look at what else was interesting. And, and again, because my interests typically fall in the 15th and 16th century, I'm forced to connect some contemporary issue to some historical issue. And it gives me an opportunity to say, OK, it's, it was really different back then and interesting. Uh, but we're still struggling with similar issues. We're still struggling with how to understand earthquakes and what they mean or, or what causes them. Uh, our, our answers might be different. Uh, and that difference is itself, I think, illuminating. The blog post allows me to do something like that. It allows me to connect my seemingly esoteric uh, work to to common trends and topics and issues that are coming up currently. Uh, yeah, I just want to add something to that. Is that online? Um, one of my more successful popular culture reference posts was the Science of River Street, which was this BBC um, Victorian forensic police drama. Um, quite schlocky, I loved it. But the important thing was I did the science of River Street, and some of it, well, a lot of it was positive. A lot of it was me saying, hey, ice pick lobotomies really existed, let me tell you about them. So there was one or two people they hadn't quite got the dates right, or the time was like, yeah. But I think there's a tendency sometimes with those to be, it was wrong, and they got this wrong, and they got that wrong. Actually, if you fit the wrong stuff in amongst like, three things they got right, it's a much more popular place that everybody likes to read in that way. The producer started following me on Twitter. You know, that was the sort of level of attention it got, and that's a much more positive way of engaging a broader audience and hey, let's look at the historicity of these popular TV programs. Yeah. I mean I think um, just going back one of the the um, sort of going back to a conversation we had earlier as well, the problem with um, finding those hooks sometimes is you're you're trying to make something sound familiar. Um, and then you run the risk of saying the past was familiar, which in some ways it is. And yet part of our job is to explain to people the past was very different in lots of ways. So it's it's finding the ones you want to work with and then ways of putting the other message as well. I don't know if you have that problem when you're, I mean, if you use that approach a lot. No, I do. I do particularly once when I compared with the state of the steam press, print periodical journals in the 19th century, and the way that we think about the internet, its effects on language, copyright, and so on and so forth. Um, that was probably the most fraught 
comparison with everything in the public space. Um, so it is, it is a difficult balancing act, particularly since the 19th century was even much closer to you know, our contemporary issues while still being removed. So can I? Oh, yes. Sorry, can I add Sorry. something to what Becky just said? Yes, thank you. For me, I precisely don't want to make the past look familiar. I, uh, that, I think, is a, is a danger. For me, the interest is, OK, here's a topic that, that people are writing about currently in journalists and in, in papers and in, in articles. The one I'm thinking of is earthquakes. People, they're, they're, the hook, then, is earthquake. For me, the interest is, all right, let's, let's look back. You know, I'm thinking to the post I just put up recently about the earthquake that hit London in 1580. I'm not interested in, in showing how that earthquake was similar. Rather, I'm interested in showing how people respond to that earthquake that is, in fact, really rather different and strange and foreign from, from the way that we think about earthquakes. And it's that difference that I think can be illuminating. Uh, I don't, and, that, and that's, so the hook is the earthquake uh, and its sort of currency in, in, at the moment. That gives me the excuse to go back and find a historical example that I think we can uh, benefit from spending a little bit of time thinking about uh, and and learn something and, no, and I, I, be engaging. Yeah. I would I would just add no, that I that's. I, I would just add that that's a, a classic, a classic and distinguished tradition in the history of science. So that's a you know it's a, it, that, that's a great way to use this stuff. Yeah, no, and, and uh, I think it's a very good way of making people reflect on the way that they or other people or the media is responding to something because it needn't be like that. It hasn't always been like that. It won't always be like that in the past and the future, absolutely. Um, sorry, Robin. Do you think it's possible to build an academic reputation now quicker using online techniques as well as offline? And does that lead to a different sort of power relationship between academics? Who are online and those who are offline, because offline will always win in the end. Okay. Um, did someone draw in some breath and have some something to say about that? Everybody in the room. I think it I think it tends to favor younger scholars. I, I would add that uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good thing or pardon me. Trying to create an online online uh, identity or, or uh, reputation comes with risks. As Nathaniel said, it favors younger scholars, but younger scholars are always uh, being watched over by more senior scholars. And at the end of the day, pass judgment on things like tenure and promotion and raises and, and jobs. So it, it's, it's a risky business that, that will, I imagine, change in a decade. Uh, or so, but it's we're not there yet. It, uh, I will confess that before I got tenure, I was uh, pretty. Uh, I, I maintained a blog, but I certainly didn't advertise it, uh, at least around my uh, my institution. Ditto. Yeah, that's <laughs> interesting. I mean, I think um, it will change. I mean, it perhaps helps you build a reputation with you know, people who might be your students or your, um, you know, postgraduate community or the early career scholars, and then probably either ignored or seen with some suspicion by more senior members of the department. I've yet to move into an academic department, you know, so in the academic environment it's obviously rather different. Um, so I, I will be interested to see how that happens. And what's interesting is when you're online, um, you get um, credit and interest from the people who are online with you, reading it, being one of those people. What you don't see, of course, are the people who aren't engaging online. They may be bitching about it in the coffee room, I don't know. Um, so it can feel like a lovely happy thing. Um, you know, I've, I've yet to see, well, I don't know, you've probably got more experience of this lately in terms of I am not personally job sure that's, that's negative. Um, I've had people who have no idea I had a blog. Um, yeah, it's just they don't notice it to have an opinion on it. Um, I would say I think there's a real difference, and I think this does apply for, for young scholars in particular, between making people aware that you exist and forging your reputation. I think having an online presence is hugely important for making people aware that you exist to invite you to conferences and talk to you and you know, agree with things. Whether or not it's sufficient to build the reputation you would then want to find out. But it is extraordinarily useful for that, for that person. Just getting your name out there and then think, oh, I'm. I'm
no struggle when you're working in that area. Let's have a look at it yourself. To get that connection, isn't it? It's well, it, there's nothing like it but for awareness raising, especially in terms of outside of your particular field and outside of your particular country. I would just add, if I may, um, you know, if we're talking about reputation in, in the, the wide world of the internet, we have to also consider reputation among whom, right? Uh, Alice Bell is a great example of someone who has a stellar reputation among among uh, science journalists, and they follow her devotedly. Uh, that. You know, and, and that may be independent of her reputation among scholars. And so, again, we have to think about these multiple audiences and, and what we mean by reputation or what we mean by a peer, right? When we talk about peer review, who counts as a peer now? It's not necessarily the half dozen people who, you know, who edit the, the journal that you most want to publish in. We might consider scientists or journalists or lay people peers in a particular area. So we have to broaden our, we have to rethink some of our definitions that, that, we, that we hold very dear. Um, perhaps one more question. I think we'll finish at half past. Um, so we have a couple more minutes if anyone. Um, yeah, right at that. I have a question for Darren. Uh, Darren, I think you made a very important statement in the course of your talk and you thought your fellow academic historians needed to get out into the public more than they do. And I'd like to ask you, how do you think they should do that? Uh, do you hear that? Yeah, I did. So how, how can academic historians get out into the public? Uh, I don't, I don't want to be normative and, and say that there's only one way. I think uh, blogs, social media, that's one venue. Uh, I think that writing letters to mm -hmm. op pages, uh, I think commenting on articles that are posted at places like, I'm a historian of science, so I'll say Scientific American, the Smithsonian, National Geographic. Uh, I think there are ways that you can reach out to local politicians. Uh, I am regularly pestering my town council. Uh, uh, I think that there are ways that academics could take what they do to local schools. Um, and schools from primary school through secondary and even to other, uh, shall we say, less well-resourced uh, colleges and universities. Um, these are some of the venues. There's, uh, and I'm speaking now in the context of sort of the mid-Atlantic, we have night school options for, for adults who want to come back and learn something new. There's always options to speak to people in those venues. Uh, Go to museums, or, you know, help out at museums, or build connections with museums. One of the things that I try to do is um, enable students here at Haverford to intern and work in the local museums and archives. But to do that means that I actually have to go out and speak to the people in those archives and those museums, build some sort of communication with them. Uh, I think these are all perhaps not terribly imaginative, but some of the ways that academics can get beyond the walls of their institutions. I think the real the real issue, though, is motivating academics to do that. Uh, it's all too easy to sit in your office, as I'm doing now, with, surrounded by your books, and you can convince yourself that you're saving the world, and the world really doesn't give a shit that you're there. <laughs> so. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we should probably just know that that's quite something cheerful to it. Um, <laughs> did you want to add anything to that one? Pardon me. Oh, um, not particularly. I, I guess the the one uh, one additional audience that that I might that I might add in my case is uh, is practitioners, scientists, and, and physicians, and so forth. Uh, I, you know, giving talks in biology departments, giving grand rounds at the medical school, uh, and so forth, um, is another important venue for getting real thinking about historians, uh, about historical issues, historical context and depth and the long view. Uh, to people who can actually use those ideas in their practice. 
Um, okay, unless there's one more wedding question, and you're very welcome to come and talk to us afterwards, and uh, those of us who are in Manchester um, can, um, if they wish, join us at tweet up um, at 6 o'clock um, in the GT Arms, GT Arms, um, which begins with the D and it's confusing me. Um, anyway, that, it's on your map, so um, do, do join, I'll be there, um, and anyone else who wants to join us. Um, and I shall end by thanking um, Alex for the technical support, um, Warren, who won't be able to hear us at the other end, um, and all the speakers, um, and, and everyone for listening through. It's an exciting experiment, I'm not sure I'll do it again, but it was <laughs> thrilling um, to do it, and can, thank you so much, guys, you joined us. Can, Sorry, can, one more thing to that? Can I just offer heartfelt thanks to uh, to Becky and Vanessa for organizing this? It was uh, a, an interesting experience. Yeah, I want I want to echo Nathaniel here. This is. Uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.